I just want to make a, an announcement for, for, for Lou Starks. Um, if anybody wants to give a talk on their work or somebody else's work, if they like, um, perhaps you could talk to Lou or myself. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> I invite Lou to give his talk. Thank you, Roger. I'll share the screen. And start off, um, start up again where I left off. But uh, let me explain. I'm going to uh, finish this survey of Witten's approach today. And then I'll start talking about aspects of virtual knot theory uh, in the next lecture and beyond. So uh, on the other hand, I have a desire to continue talking about Witten's work. So I'm going to do that or have been doing that a little in what we call at the UIC, the quantum topology seminar. Quantum topology seminar meets online on Thursdays at 3 p.m. Chicago time. So if you're interested in hearing a, con a discussion of the perturbative expansion of Witten's integral and other things like that for a while, uh, I'll be talking about them in the quantum topology seminar. And if you would send me an email saying you'd like to be added to the list for that seminar, I'll put you on the list. I think that's uh, 9 p.m. British summertime. Uh, yeah, it is a little late. But yeah. that's that's what it is. Well, it's either that or watch telly. So, <laughs> what's the date? What what days of the week is are the QT seminars? It's just, it's on Zoom, and uh, I I incite it uh, with a different code each time. So, if you're interested in it, I'm sorry. Day of the week. Thursday, 3 p.m. Chicago time. Right. Right. So this is where I was before. Um, we were talking about curvature and the turn Simons Lagrangian. So I'll say a little more about that. Um, first of all, what about the curvature? Well, we're thinking of I plus A of X as the matrix one form that performs the parallel translation. So I'm going to just do the calculation going around a small loop. I'm actually going to go around lower part upper and uh, left upper right hor horizontal on the top and look at the difference between those two. So remember that uh, A is expressed all the way out as uh, a sum of functions of space with some indices k and a that depend on a list of matrices that form a basis for the Lie algebra and uh, and x k which goes k goes from one to three um, and I can hide the Lie algebra index and just talk about a matrix valued a k of x dx k so if we uh, if we multiply on the right, we have i of a of x and then i of i plus a at x plus di. Um, so that a of x plus di becomes a of x plus the i partial of a of x times dxi. And then I multiply them out uh, and I have written it out and then I multiply it out and as you see, I get uh, some terms. The significant ones to think about are the products of AK and AL uh, and uh, the DIAJ. And if I did it in the opposite order, which is what I have written out, uh, I don't think I have a pointer here, but uh, I have written out the previous computation at the top and then I'm doing the computation around the other side. And of course, things get flipped in order. What was a DIAJ becomes a DJAI. And some terms, if you take the difference, go away. 
and you are left with the DIAJ minus DJAI and a commutator of AK and AL. And that is the curvature tensor at the level of, uh, of the names of the matrices. Uh, so um, that's where uh, this comes in. And it was a physicist's observation, Yang and Mills, I presume, that uh, that this gen this idea generalizes electromagnetism, because if the AI and the AJ don't commute with one commute commute with one another, uh, then uh, this is the formula for the electromagnetic field from a potential A. On the other hand, if you like differential forms, then uh, you can see the the a packed up form of the curvature, because if you take da plus a where j uh then uh you get the same uh terms you see diaj and aiaj and then uh if you put the forms in order i less than j then you get the differences on the commutator so uh so the curvature terms are exactly what happens when you take da plus a where j in differential forms and uh so that's a nice packed up way of thinking about what the curvature is and and then um, there are some other patterns which have to do with what Chern and Simons did. If you take the curvature and multiply it by itself, thinking that there might be a a, a fourth variable in there, uh, then you see that uh, you get a certain thing. And if you take the derivative of the Chern Simons form, a wedge d a plus two thirds a wedge a, you see you get all of that except the fourth product of A with itself. And you know, Chern and Simons deal with that kind of relationship. And when they're integrating these things, uh, via, you get a formula via Stokes theorem that says integral, that would say in this case, integral over the three sphere of the Chern Simons is equal to the integral over the four ball of the D of the Chern Simons, which is the F wedge F over D4. Uh, and and so what they were about is uh, handling secondary characteristic classes using differential geometry and finding these forms whose differentials were powers of the curvature. Uh, and if you look back uh, on the web, you can find their papers and what they were doing with all of this. Witten in this work took hold of the specific churn simons form that I've written in the middle of the page and makes use of it. You might think that uh, one could get some traction about um, cobordism of knots or, or generalizing to uh, the fourth dimension in some way by using the larger category of these forms and the differentials, but I don't know much about that. Um, what we're using for the Lagrangian in the integral, of course, is the integral over R3 of the trace of that Chern Simons form. And, um, and then there's this detailed curvature relationship. If you just look at the Chern Simons form and imagine differentiating it with respect to A as though that were a symbol, why then you see that the curvature would come out and maybe something else. Uh, but in point of fact, what you need to do if you're going to do the sort of thing that we're doing is write, out, write it all the way out into the Lie algebra and think about what happens when you integrate the trace and do some calculation. And then you find that this formula comes out, that if you differentiate that L with respect to an A upper A lower K, uh, then it gives you the curvature terms which are also the ones that come out when you put in the Lie algebra and, and write out coefficients. But it doesn't give it to you quite directly. If you took the kth derivative there, then you need to switch uh, to i and j by multiplying by an epsilon i j and summing over k. A technical little formula, which is fun to work out, but I wouldn't try to show it to you here. Uh, and then, uh, to review, uh, we had the other side of things, which was the topological side, 
where we take a curve and we move it a little bit so that the difference between the curve and the curve moved a little bit is actually the little loop. So the, the integration of the connection around the loop uh, is picking up a little bit around a small loop. And we know that that gives you curvature. So uh, the way it gives you curvature is what I, what I was doing with the curvature, except I didn't include the Lie algebra. By the time you include the Lie algebra into the curvature uh, expression, it becomes a certain coefficient, f upper a lower ij. Uh, dxi dxj happens, and, and a Lie algebra matrix gets inserted into the product of things. And that's what I've written in the diagram there. Uh, I had said this before, but, but you can see now with a little more sight of it, how this is happening from the point of view of calculating curvature the way I did. And, um, and then I'm using these notations. And, and then we put it all together and I'll remind you how that looks uh, by integrating, but integrating just means respecting integration by parts, as far as I'm concerned here. So I started with an e to the kl and the variant, variated loop, uh, which got a, a bit of curvature inserted into it. But curvature is equal to derivative of l uh, with an epsilon tied to it. And so I can put the derivative on the e to the kl and then I can integrate by parts, which switches the derivative back to the loop. And we saw before that differentiating the loop inserts a dx and a matrix in. And given that we're summing over indices the way we are, that there's this line coming up out of the d that, uh, that ties into matrices inserted into the loop, we find after differentiating one more time, that there's a double Lie algebra insertion into the loop and a volume form has occurred. And so if that volume form should shut out, if, if in fact the deformation didn't use three coordinates, then this would be zero. So this is saying at this level of the heuristics that the Witten integral will be invariant under movements of the loop, which are more or less planar. But if you had a little twist, like a framing twist, then you would be using three dimensions. Also, if you're thinking about a skein relation, then you're moving one line and keeping the other one fixed. So that movement is two dimensional, but something else happens because at a certain point, the two lines touch. At the point when they touch, if you're, if you're looking at this between two lines touching and two lines not touching, then the place where they touch and the place where you differentiate the, the loop, you would differentiate along the loop in two directions because you, at the point where they touch, you're differentiating in that direction and the other direction. Adding the other direction into the brew means that the volume form won't cut out. And the insertion at the bottom will be uh, I had hoped that I had a slide right there, but apparently I didn't. That's too bad. There it is. Um, it, the, the insertion will be in the other direction. One line is moving and had its original insertion from that differentiation. The other line is not moving, but differentiation picks it up at the point when the two lines intersect. And that insertion ha has a non-zero volume form associated with it. So if you believe that story, you get this story here, which says that the skein relation will have the form one over K, it's on constant times the integration performed on a line where there's been a double the algebra insertion into the line. And of course that's up to higher orders. So that's the skein relation, but that's also as you see, if you're familiar with the idea of Vassiliev invariance, telling you that if you were to look at the expansion of the integral in powers of one over K, then every time you add a graphical vertex, defining Z at the graphical vertex by the difference, every time you added a graphical vertex, 
the result would be divisible by one more power of one over k. So that means that the coefficient of one over k to the n is going to vanish for graphs with more than n nodes. And that makes those coefficients the Cilia invariance of finite type. And so that's how at this level of formalism, things get related to Vassiliev invariance. I'll say more about that in a moment. Now, wait a minute. I skipped a couple of slides. Uh, one of them I wanted to make a comment about. What did we do in case you worry that we're integrating illegitimately? Well, we are integrating illegitimately, and I couldn't, I couldn't attest that any of the integrals that we wrote are numbers. Um, on the other hand, we're integrating, uh, saying that uh, we're allowed to use integration by parts. So if you said that two functions are equivalent, if you can get from one to the other by integration by parts, that is, if their difference is a derivative, then we showed that the original uh, Witten functional, which is on the left in this slide, is equivalent to this other one, uh, where we had a volume form and a Lie algebra insertion. So that is a that is a bit of differential geometry about these functions, which is perfectly good mathematics. Uh, and then the question is, can you make numbers out of these equivalence classes? Uh, uh, theories of integration do that. Uh, if you if someday somebody makes a beautiful theory of integration over all gauge fields or over all gauge fields modulo some equivalence of them, then um, everything we've said might become completely rigorous. It is to be hoped. Uh, okay. I'm going to skip this part where I was telling you, but it's interesting. I was telling you that if you take very specific uh, representations of Lie algebras, like this one here for SU3, then you can go through the formalism of the Lie algebra and see what insertion of it means. This kind of exercise occurs for people who study Vassiliev invariance because they do the double Lie algebra insertion for purely Vassiliev invariant reasons, which don't have to depend on what we said. I'll talk about that in a moment. And then these kind of computations with the Lie algebra are quite common in thinking about how weight systems for Vassiliev invariance work. Our physicists have organized a lot of specific lore about Lie algebras for their own purposes, as you know. So one of the identities that's interesting is this one for the SUN, where the double Lie algebra insertion turns out to be the same as taking Kronecker deltas in two different ways along the lines, taking them uh, horizontally smooth or cross connected like that, and then putting that into the situation and finding out what kind of skein relations the invariants have. Mm -hmm. At the yes, yes, there was a question. No, oh, I thought there was a question. Okay. Um, and then if you do that, if you, I don't want to uh, drag you through it in detail, but if you do that, like with the SUN thing here, then you find that you get a clear uh, heuristic up to higher orders for, so that you will get the correct results if you think of one plus a constant as e to the constant, uh, you will get the correct uh, skein relations for the Humphrey polynomial out of the SUN, for example. Uh, so that's all interesting and amusing. Um, I'm going to digress for a moment about a physical application that happened around the time that Witten did this work. Um, around that time, uh, Smolin and Rovelli were working with a formulation of quantum gravity due to Abhay Ashtakar. And in their theory, the uh, the uh, metric on the space was replaced by uh, a gauge connection. And the gauge, so that the wave function for that quantum theory is a function of a gauge connection. 
for the group SLC, SL2, SL3, no, SL2. Yeah, anyway, a group. Mm -hmm. And um, SL3 for, for, for these purposes. And, uh, and so you have a function of a gauge connection. And they wanted to uh, understand what kind of constraints were on these functions by doing an integral like Witten's. So instead of having e to the churn Simons, you have some arbitrary psi of a, and then you integrate it again over all the fields, um, all the connections, the Wilson loop for the loop k, and you get a function of the loop. So that's what we did, right? We did that for the exponentiated churn Simons function. They uh, would work with this formalism for an arbitrary gauge field and an arbitrary function and an arbitrary loop. So this looks like a kind of transform, which takes you from functions of fields to functions of loops. And that's why it was originally called loop quantum gravity. And if you had a differential operator that was supposed to have some nice behavior on the functional psi, you can transform it to a differential operator that would, be, would do something to the Wilson loop, as you see here, by integrating by parts. So that's what I've done. I have a uh, nabla applied to psi hat, uh, a function on a loop will be the integral of nabla applied to psi and multiply by the Wilson loop. But then integrating by parts, I put the nabla now on the Wilson loop. And you know that putting a nabla, putting a differential operator on the Wilson loop will do funny things like insert algebra into it and grab tensors and pull them out and so on, just as we've seen. So in fact, they had the following differential operator, which I've written diagrammatically here. There's our, glow, our gauge functional derivative tied into the curvature tensor in this funny way. Never mind that you don't know what it means. Uh, I'm just showing you its formalism. So here's this operator G, and we're going to transform it. So we transform it and find out what it does to the loop. And lo and behold, when, it, when you actually apply it to the loop, it inserts a matrix and a D, and it gives us the curvature tensor inserted into the loop in exactly the way that we understood would locally be the same as deforming the loop. So the, this differential operator applied to an arbitrary psi is the same as deforming the loop a little bit. And so it, uh, it may be that the psi that they use would give a link invariant. If psi was the exponentiated churn simons functional, it would. And otherwise, uh, you would find out that its non-topological invariance of this thing on the right had to do with the fact that this g did not annihilate their wave function. So they were going back and forth in this way. And they found that uh, they could then begin to understand their attempt at doing uh, a quantum version of general relativity in terms of this kind of work. Um, and I had another comment. What was it? Um, oh, yes. The churn in their original theory, the churn Simons functional, the e to the churn si integral churn Simons form trace. Uh, that turned out to be a state in their quantum gravity theory. Um, and that's what the beginnings of the loop quantum gravity theory looks like. Uh, of course, you need to see how Ashtakar transformed variables in general relativity so that they became gauge connection variables. Very interesting. There's a book in the Knots and Everything series by John Bias and Munayan, which um, does the differential geometry of gauge fields and all of that reformulation um, very beautifully, uh, in case you wanted to read about it. And then the, uh, the theory changed uh, quite a bit uh, over the years after those uh, middle 90s pictures that I'm showing you. Uh, and if you were to read surveys of loop quantum gravity at the present time, you would see spin networks and all sorts of things, and you might not see any functional integrals. Perhaps they started to worry about the functional integrals being rigorous. Uh, what about the uh, 
bacilli of invariants. Uh, I think I am repeating myself a little bit, but uh, the overlap uh, will help it remain a little more coherent than otherwise. I remind you that um, uh, that bacilli of uh, uh, in combination with Joan Berman and uh, and Lynn. Uh, uh, made the definition of finite type facility of invariants very popular and extracted from the full uh, full point of view that facility have had originally. So you can just think of it as some kind of generalized skein theory. You have a uh, an invariant of links and also graphs, rigid vertex graphs, and you assume that the invariant different the difference of the invariant on a plus crossing and a minus crossing will give you the invariant of the link node. Um, and then you say it's a finite type if it vanishes for graphs with more than k n nodes, the finite type n. So for example, in this diagram below, the, here's a, an embedded uh, knot with two nodes and one ordinary crossing. If the invariant were of type two, and you took the skein difference on that crossing that's sitting there, you'd get zero because the difference would be a graph with three nodes. So that means that at type two, an embedded graph with two nodes will have a value independent of the way it's embedded in space. So one then looks at just the graphical structure and writes down a chord diagram for the nodal structure. And that's what I've written here. Um, I've ignored the actual crossing and only, only paid attention to the nodes and gone along one, then two, then one, then two. And, uh, and so if you had an invariant of type two, then chord diagrams with two chords in them would be evaluated somehow combinatorially and that would be the base of the invariant. And if you started with this idea, you might think, aha, all right, I'll do a skein theory here and I'll, I will get a wonderful skein theory that tells me how to evaluate in terms of these base diagrams. But if you start working on the skein theory, you find out that except in one or two special cases, you are going to need the values of things which are embedded as well in order to understand what's going on. Um, uh, Ted Stanford, uh, working with Joan Berman, uh, wrote papers about how to do it in a purely skein theoretic way by setting up evaluations that are above this top level. And um, his papers are still interesting to look at. And in the 90s, there was uh, a lot of activity about uh, the Salif invariants and this kind of combinatorics of evaluation. Uh, there's also a general theorem. The general theorem you've already seen at a certain level of rigor, which is if you think of the Lie algebra insertions as coming from Witten's invariant, then Witten's invariant is telling you that it's picking up the Solyev invariants from, a, from a, a Lie algebra that you chose. And so, you're going to get Lie, you're going to get Vasiliev invariants corresponding to choices of Lie algebra by getting the invariants out of the invariants that come from Witten's integral. But one would like to extract or otherwise get that theorem without having to worry about the existence of integrals. Now this slide is just reminding you what I just said, that if the graph has k nodes and it is a type k invariant, then the evaluation is independent of the embedding of the graph. Um, I already remarked on that, but, but here is the combinatorial topology uh, of these evaluations, the key point about the relationship between the combinatorial topology and the Vasily invariance. If you had a little bit of loop that goes underneath uh, a node, you could slide it out by the Reinemeister moves available for the rigid vertex graphs and then slide it across the top. So those two would be equal, but you can also get from one to the other by switching identities. And that's what I've done here. Um, maybe I should point. 
Um, in this case, I've taken this crossing, which is a positive crossing, and I switched it to make a negative crossing, and I put in a node. Okay, so I get a nodal two-node uh, diagram on the right, and of course I mean evaluate the invariant in each case. Then I took this term and put it here and switched the next crossing up. And that happened to be a negative crossing to begin with, so I need a minus sign here and nodes here. Then I took uh, this one and I put it here and I switched this one up. And that was a negative crossing, so I needed a negative sign and I got two nodes here. And then I took the last one and I switched it up and that was a positive crossing and so I got a plus sign here. And now these, when I add them all up, cancel because this and this are the same and this and this are the same and this and this are the same and this and this are topologically the same. So I add them up and I get a relation. I get an embedded uh, four element relation involving double nodes. And it has a nice pattern. On one line, there are two nodes. On another, on another one of these pictures, the two nodes have reversed their order. And similarly, on the other line, there are two nodes and they reverse their order. If you put it into the chord diagram language, on one line, there are two nodes. On another version of it, they've switched their order. Equals, on one line, there are two nodes and on the other one, they've switched their order. So, um, so at least at the beginning, you could say, I must take all uh, pictures of, uh, of graphs like this uh, modulo these relations uh, in order to build an invariant that at least I need. How much do I need in order to build an invariant? Well, we suspect from what we did before, as by 2020 hindsight, that all we need is this relation at the level of the evaluations that don't depend on the embeddings at the top row, as people say. So, what about the top row? The top row are graphs with n nodes where there are n, uh, where the invariant is of type n. But the thing that gets noticed if you go back and forth comparing Witten's point of view with this idea, the thing that gets noticed and probably first gets noticed by Barnatan is that this relation that is needed in the Vassiliev invariance can be thought of as a consequence of a fact about Lie algebras. That is to say, look at the pattern here. If I diagrammatically multiply two matrices and I subtract from them the opposite order multiplication of those two matrices, now these matrices have an upper index which just is a bookkeeping. I have matrices T1, T2, T3. So I have T1 times T2 and here I have ah, T2 times T1 because the index is reversed. And that the difference, the commutator, is going to be equal to a sum of coefficients times the elements in the algebra. The algebra is closed under commutators. So that's a structure coefficient. Um, and I'm writing it as an F upper AB lower C. And so you get this kind of diagrammatic pattern where this is some trivalent node. But now imagine that the trivalent node um, is invariant under cyclic permutation, so you can push it around in the plane and look at what happens to the difference in the larger diagram for the chord relation, imagining that it obeyed this, uh, this relation coming from Lie algebra. Then you see this difference is equal to structure constant, trivalent node inserted but I push the trivalent node over here because it's invariant under cyclic permutation. So it's topological in the diagrammatic sense. And then I open it up again, and that's the other side of the four term relation. So you see what happens is that the Lie algebra is actually almost, co Lie algebra as a structure is almost coincident with the desire to have a relation of this kind. And, and so that's very interesting and worth exploring on its own right. But for the sake of getting evaluations for Vassiliev invariance, it means that you could do the following kind of thing. You take the chord diagram that uh, is sitting here for the Vassiliev invariant and you put into it um, 
Lie algebra for each one of these chords, right? Uh, and then you sum over the product of the Lie algebra elements and you sum over the uh, indices on these chords uh, corresponding to the basis for the Lie algebra. So here I would take trace over the sum of A over A and B of T A, T B, T A, T B. But this is, from our point of view, a Wilson loop stripped down of everything, right? These are the these are the insertions into the Wilson loop that we were talking about. But here we've evaluated it without evaluating anything about the holonomy. It's just the part of the matrix insertion that happened combinatorially. So you see that this is what is sitting inside of Witten's integral as well. These basic evaluations of chord diagrams. And so the the theory of the Vasily of invariance and the theory of Witten's integral are are formally very close to one another. Uh, and what about this? Um, and then one go, one can go on and study uh, the weight systems for Vasily of invariance that can come from various Lie algebras and study all that using combinatorics and algebra on directly. But you still have to ask, given such a weight system which would satisfy what you need for a top row, uh, how do you know you get an invariant associated with it? Uh, well, I'll come back to that in a moment. But the other thing about the identity that I was talking about is I gave it to you at matrix level. I said, ah, a commutator and a structure coefficient. But there's another level of this, in case you wish to think about the algebra, uh, and the pattern occurs at both levels for good reasons if you think about it, but I'll just show you the other level. The other level is that its trivalent vertex could be a categorical entity which indicates the product. Now, in this case, the product would be the commutator. We're talking about an abstract Lie algebra now. It has a product, a non-associative product. And the product satisfies that if you twist the lines, if you permute them, if you take BA, you'll get minus AB. And then all of these little diagrams that I drew can be interpreted as certain products. For example, this one is A times B and then times C. And remember, it's not associative. And so this one is A times C and then times B. And this one is A times B times C. And so this identity says A times B times C minus a times c times b is equal to a times b times c. It's convenient to flip that sign by changing the order of multiplication. And then it says a times b times c plus b times a times c equals a times b times c. In other words, a acts by the Leibniz rule as though it were a, diff uh, a, 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 a derivative acting on b times c. You get a is an operator is operating on B, plus A is an operator is operating on C, Leibniz rule. And the definition of a Lie algebra is that it should satisfy B A is minus A B and the Jacobi identity. So at the level of abstract algebra, this is indeed the footprint of a Lie algebra. And so what one sees by that elementary facility of invariant derivation is that knot theory and Lie algebras are just tightly related to one another. And that's the whole story of, that's the whole story of the beginning of the facility of invariants, which stand on their own, but are related to the physics of the integral in, in roughly in the ways that I was talking about. Now, uh, one last comment is that if you, if you take Witten's integral and you write a, uh, what's called a perturbative expansion of it, which means expanding it in powers of one over K. Remember it was E to the K times the Lagrangian, powers of the coupling constant uh, by, if you write it out and you manipulate the gauge fields in the right way, you can get to a sum of integrals that do exist that look like this, where I'm taking horizontal planes in three space, they're complex planes, and in those planes are pairs of points, chords, in some chord diagram pattern, 
and then you integrate along the uh, points on the knot, dzi minus dzi prime divided by zi minus zi prime, um, an integral that uh, an integral form that may be familiar to you, maybe not from the physical point of view, uh, as Konsevich's integral. A Konsevich um, observed in those days that these kinds of integrations will produce invariants. They will produce facility invariants from given weight systems by starting with the weight systems at the bottom and doing these sp special integrals in, in a pattern like this. These integrals actually do come from Witten by taking a perturbative expansion. So the, there's this tight relationship between the physics uh, or the mathematical physics of Witten's way of thinking about it and what people do in the pure mathematics of the Siliaf invariants. Uh, and of course, there are other stories about producing the Vassiliev invariants. You can do it by these integrals, and you can also do it by complex algebra, Drinfeld associators, which, um, which are uh, an algebraic counterpart to doing uh, these integrals. And all, 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 all such things produce rather complex ways of getting to the invariant uh, that are hard to compute course. And the other direction is that if you start with a quantum invariant, if you start with an invariant from an R matrix from a Yang-Baxter solution, and it has a parameter in it that you can expand on, like the Jones polynomial does, then you get lots of facility of invariants directly from the invariant by looking at things that are really analogs of perturbative expansions like that. So that's the survey. Uh, that I wanted to make about about the Witten integral and its relationship with a lot of knot theory. Um, there are two places where I don't understand how it's related, and maybe nobody does. One would be, why shouldn't you figure out how to generalize the Kovana homology from this point of view? Well, if you look at what people have been doing, they do, but it it's much more complicated than this level. Um, and uh, what about including virtual knot theory into this picture? Well, if you wanted to go back to the topology for virtual knot theory, you probably need to think of the virtual knots as sitting in thickened surfaces, as that's where they really come from, uh, as topological entities. And then you can think about this sort of integration in other manifolds. So it's possible, but, uh, but I haven't seen anything coherent about using uh, this, these kind of approaches for virtual knot theory. What else do I have in this remark? That's what I just said. And, uh, and the next step would be Kovana homology if I were going in this direction. So that's the end of this survey of the Witten point of view. What I'm going to do in, in the quantum topology seminar, but not here, is continue on into the perturbative expansion, and I'll show how you can get the conservative integrals from the uh, expansion of Witten's integral and some other things like that. Okay. Um, let me uh, talk for a couple of minutes about about virtual knots, and then we'll stop. I'm getting a blackboard, a whiteboard. Okay, so you'll recall that I gave you an exercise and so I thought I should solve this exercise and talk about it for a moment, right? So here is the virtual trefoil and, um, and that's one, one exercise would be to compute the bracket polynomial for the virtual trefoil. Another 
exercise. is to change a trefoil knot into another knot by doing this. And I think that was the exercise that I mentioned. So we'll give this one a name and I'll just call this one K tilde. Of course, you should compute the bracket polynomial for that. But, um, but what happened when I went from trefoil to this. Well, what I did was I started with a crossing like this, this one. Let me finish. Oh, well, the arrows are going, yeah, no matter. Uh, I started with a, from, with a crossing like this and I said, okay, um, instead of going this way, I'm going to go this way. So I still end up going from below to above, but at the point of doing the crossing, I'm reversing my direction. I keep it under, but I'm reversing my direction. So if this crossing is a plus crossing, then this crossing is a minus crossing. And that's how this got changed. Um, the question is, what will happen if you compute the bracket for such an entity. So I wanted to give myself enough room to just do it here. So, so I'm concerned therefore with computing the bracket of something that looks like this. And so I go ahead and do it and I get A times that plus A inverse times that. And that's the same as A, a times. Pardon me? I think A and A inverse are, are switched. I, I didn't hear you. A and A inverse. I think you've got them backwards. No. Um, oh, okay. But I, but I should remind you of the convention. Uh, uh, let me get rid of this. I mean, there's just a convention, and uh, I forget it as readily as anybody else. Uh, the convention I'm using is that uh, this will go to a times that plus a inverse times that. Right. So here. That's the A and this is the A inverse, right? Uh, but, but in any case, these virtual crossings just disappear uh, from the scene. And so this is the same as the bracket of this. So this is a, you might say this is a great weakness of, the, of this extension of the bracket. It doesn't see flanking virtual crossings. They can be removed. And if you were to remove them from, uh, this uh, one that we were looking at, let's, let's do a the removal. So I remove that, then I remove that. And I'm sorry I put these arrows in because the smoothings might become anti-smoothings and we don't care because we're doing the unoriented bracket, right? Um, so I'm just being careful about which way I'm, uh, I'm smoothing in relation to these, right? You will walk along like this. And I had a right to be careful because you see the, 
the result that I got was an umnot. And so that says that, uh, that, the, uh, that the bracket of this guy here is equal to minus a q, or that f of it, if you normalized it, would be equal to one. Or in other words, the Jones polynomial of this knot is equal to one. So we've located a knot with Jones polynomial equal to one. And that would be more exciting if it were classical, um, but it leads to certain questions, right? Uh, how did it happen? Can I generalize it? And maybe you could somehow get a real knot that had Jones polynomial equal to one by starting here and then modifying it somehow. That I have no idea how to do. Um, but what, what the pattern of this is, is interesting. And how much time do we have left? Maybe, maybe I say the pattern and, um, and stop. So, so we started with uh, this situation. And I went into the virtual world by doing this. And then I found that it had the same bracket as smoothing it. In precisely this way, but that is topologically the same as this. And this is the result of switching the crossing. Ah, okay. So that means that the evaluation of this virtual knot uh, by the bracket is the same as evaluating the original one by switching the crossing. And we started out with the trefoil knot. And if you switch the crossing of the trefoil knot, why then you get the unknot? So, so then you see I can make a lot of examples of this kind. I just take some knot and find a, a collection of crossings that will switch it to the unknot and apply this construction at each of those crossings. And I will have a virtual knot with Jones polynomial equal to one. Now, first of all, I claim that all of these knots are non-trivial. They're definitely non-trivial. You can see they're non-trivial by looking at another property of the virtualization construction. I started here and I went to here and ask yourself what happens to the unoriented quandle. So A, B, and A, B, the um, unoriented quandle where A, B, B is equal to A, okay. Um, and, and then um, I start with A and B here. And B goes along through because that's what I'm going to do to generalize the quandle to the virtual situation. I'm just, just ignoring, that's the simplest thing I can do. And so this is B all the way, oops, there's a, yeah, that's B all the way over to there. Here we have A coming in and here we have A, B. Right, uh, you're going to get a b if you have a coming in this way or this way. It doesn't matter. No orientation, and this comes out a b. So you see that the unoriented quandle can't see this operation, it, 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 uh, and that means that the uh, that the unoriented quandle of this is equal to the unoriented quandle of the result of virtualizing. So we go back to the trefoil and we say, well, what is the unoriented quandle of the trefoil? That's non-trivial. So therefore, the unoriented quandle of the virtualized trefoil is also non-trivial. So we know it's a non-trivial knot. What we don't yet know is that it's not a classical knot. You have to prove that this guy that we produce is not classical, not equivalent to a classical. That it really is living on a surface and not uh, in the plane. And there are lots of ways to prove that, but I'm out of time. So the exercise has been extended now 
to for you to prove that this is not classical without looking at anything. I'll stop there. Oh, thanks, um, Lou. Uh, um, of course, I mean, this is what, what I decided to call switch knot theory. Or, the, or theory of switch of, of uh, well, I, if you put in the equivalence relation, yeah. Well, we don't. I, I haven't yet put in the equivalence relation. I'm I am happy to put it in, and then you could call it switch knot theory, or, or what, it wasn't switch swap, that you were going to call. It. What, what were you going to call? Swap knots. Swap knots. All right, if you like. Um, swapped knot theory. Right. So it's another kind of generalized knot theory. Yes, it is. And, and we've had that around. We call it uh, Z-knot theory before, but swap, swap is OK. Um, uh, we certainly would like to know. For example, there are knots that have Jones polynomial 1 that are not, uh, that, that are not swap equivalent to classicals. Oh. I can show you examples of them. Uh, the problem about knots that are uh, I have Jones polynomial one is not finished, but the ones that are swap classical that are swap equivalent to classicals, uh, uh, they aren't going to give you counterexamples to the conjecture. We can also prove that. Hmm. When I do this, when I make counterexamples of this kind, they will never be classical. Well, I'll prove that later. But I mean, I would say that. In order to prove that um, knot you've got is non-trivial, uh, you, uh, I bet the the, the biquandle would do it. Yes, I think the biquandle will do it. Um, there are there are a lot of ways to do it. Uh, that's, but but it gives you a it, it's a good example of a source of wanting other invariants. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm you know in my talk on Friday, I'm going to talk about these kind of knots um, and and how you how you get biquandle invariance from them so good good that will if you could prove that all such things are non-classical by using the biquandle invariance that would be great what we eventually found was that we could use the fact big fact that corona homology for classical knots detects it detects on knottedness and we can use that and the fact that there's Kovana homology for virtuals to deduce that none of these can be counterexamples. But that's using a fairly big gun. Uh, and so it would be great if a very specific kind of invariant could be used to capture this class of knots. I mean, you know, it's my belief that um, that in some sense the biquandle of of virtual knots is as a class of, is a classifier i mean um, uh, and that would be wonderful to prove too i have no idea how one would prove it this is just a guess well it probably involves real three-dimensional topology just like the original classifier proof does maybe but there's not a Topological interpretation for the biquandle, so that makes it much more difficult. Oh yeah, thank you for reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a mysterious object, like a lot yeah. of mathematics, like a lot of mathematicians. <laughs> yeah. I, may I make a comment uh, to 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 Vasily about Vasily invariance? Uh -huh. This is Sergei. Um, yeah. uh -huh. So uh, it found that conservation is a universal Vasiliev invariant. So it covers all the Vasiliev invariants. But from the other hand, there is the sum of Trevorel that uh, there are Vasiliev invariants which do not come from Lie algebras. Yes, indeed. Because so uh, so you, 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 you know, when you make the full theory of Vasiliev invariants, you go much farther than the than the basic physics can give you. Yes, yes. So that means that if you can extract Kansevich integral from Witten's approach from integrals, it should be something more than gauge theories and Lie algebras 
there. It should be something more in that written approach. Uh, uh, in yeah, words. that's so right. There should be a, on top of needing a definition of the integral, the whole thing should be, the whole scheme should be generalized way beyond where it sits. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. And thank you for, for, for excellent lecture. Thank yeah, you. Thank you, Lou. Um, are there any other questions or comments or? So thank you quite a lot, Lou. Thank you. See you Friday. Okay. So I will end now going, going, gone.